The Christian in Complete Armor by William Grinnell. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 17 b. Chapter 11, The Converting Power of the Word. Fourthly, the work of conversion, which none but God, who is the God of all grace, can produce. When John's disciples came to Christ to be resolved who he was, whether the Messiah or not, Matthew 11, verses 4 through 5, Christ did not tell them who he was, but sends them to take their answer from the marvelous works he did. Go and show John again those things which ye do hear and see. The blind receive their sight, and the lame walk. The lepers are cleansed, and the deaf hear. The dead are raised up, and the poor have the gospel preached to them. Or gospelized, that is. They are transformed into the very nature of the gospel, and actuate by the Spirit which breathes in the gospel, by which Christ's drift was to give an ocular demonstration of the faith that he who did such miracles could be no other than he whom they sought, and that which brings up the rear is the converting power of the word, not set last, because the least among them, but rather because it is the greatest wonder of them all, and comprehends in it all the other. When souls are converted, the blind receive their sight. You were darkness, but now light in the Lord. The lame walk, and that affections the soul's feet, are set at liberty, and receive strength to run the ways of God with delight. Lepers are cleansed, in that filthy lusts are cured, and foul souls are sanctified, and so of the rest. Now, though the former miracles cease, yet this, which is the greatest, still accompanying the word, affords such a demonstration for its divinity, as reason itself cannot oppose. Is it beyond the skill and strength of the mightiest angel to make the least pile of grass in the field, much more the new creature in the heart, the noblest of God's works? That, therefore, which new molds the heart, and makes the creature as unlike to his former self as the lamb is to the wolf, the one meek and harmless, the other fierce and ravious, must needs be from God, and such changes are the daily product of the word. How many, once under the power of their lust, throwing like madmen their firebrands about, possessed with as many devils as sins, and hurried hither and thither by their furies, yet at hearing of one gospel sermon have you not seen them quite metamorphosed and with him in the gospel, out of whom the devil was cast, sitting at Jesus' feet in the right mind, bitterly bewailing their former co course, and hating their once beloved lusts, more than ever they were fond of them. I hope some of you can say, concerning yourselves as the apostle doth of himself and others of his brethren, Titus 3, verses 3 and 5. We ourselves also were sometimes foolish, disobedient, deceived, serving divers lusts and pleasures, etc. But after that the kindness and love of God our Savior appeared. He saved us by the washing of regeneration, etc. And can you, who are the very epistle of Christ, written not with ink, but with the Spirit of the living God, in the fleshly tables of your heart, stand ye in doubt whether the word came from God, which is thus able to bring you home to God? How long might a man sit at the foot of a philosopher before he can find such a commanding power go forth with his lectures of morality to take away his old heart full of lust and put a new and holy one in the room of it? Some indeed in their school have been a little refined from the dredges of sensuality, as uh, Polmo, P-O-L-E-M-O, who went a drunkard to hear Plato and returned a temperate man with, from his lecture. And no wonder if we consider what violence such beastly sins offer to the very light of a natural conscience, that lesser light appointed by God to rule the night of the heathen world. But take the best philosopher of them all, and you shall find sins that are of a little finer spinning, such as spiritual wickedness and heart sins are, that are acted behind the curtain in the retiring room of the inner man. These were so far from being the spoils of the victorious arms that they could never come to the sight of them. But the word treads on these high places of spiritual wickednesses, and leaves not any stronghold of them untaken. It pursues sin and Satan to their bogs and fatnesses. It digs the sinner's lust like vehemence out of their holes and barrels. 
the heart itself is no safe sanctuary for sin to sit in. The word will take it thence, and Joab from the horns of the altar to slay it. These corruptions that escape the sword of the moralist and honest heathen fall by the edge of the, the word. I cannot give a better instance of this converting power of the word than by presenting you with the miraculous victories obtained by it over the hearts of men. When the apostles were sent out first to preach the grace of Christ, whenever they came they found the world up in arms against them, and the devil at the head of their troops to make their utmost resistance. Yet what unheard of victories were got by them. Was it not strange that without drawing any other sword than the everlasting gospel they should turn the world upside down, as their enemies themselves confessed, sliding the devil's works, casting down his holes wherever they came, and overcoming those barbarous heathens whom the devil had held in his peaceable possession so many thousand years to renounce their idolatries, in which they had been bred and trained up all their days to receive a new Lord in him who crucified Jesus, and this at the report of a few silly men loaded with the vilest reproaches that the wit of men could invent or ma malice rake together to besmear their persons and render the doctrine they preach odious to the world. This, I say, is such an unheard of conquest as could not be obtained by any less than the arm of the Almighty, especially if we take two or three circumstances into our consideration. First, the meanness of the persons employed to preach this doctrine, being of the meanest and the lowest of the people, and many of them as mean in their intelligence accomplishments as they were in their external appearance in the world, having no help from human learning to raise their parts and set a varnish upon their discourses. Men very unfit for such an enterprise had the success of their works depended on their own furniture, which put their very enemies to a stand whence they had their wisdom, knowing well how low their parentage and unsuitable that were their breeding to give them any advantage towards such a high undertaking. Acts 4.13 Surely these poor men could contribute no more by anything that was their own, so that wonderful success which followed their labors, than the blowing of the ram's horns, carried by the laying of Joshua's walls flat uh, with the ground, or the sounding of Jehoshaphat's musical instruments, and the rooting of so formidable an army of his enemies, so that he, we must attribute it to the breath of God, by which they sounded the trumpet of the gospel in the sweet spirit, charming the hearts of the hearers that such a mighty works were done by them. Secondly, if we consider the nature of the doctrine they held forth and commanded to the world, which was not only strange and new, enough to make the hearer shy of it, but so contrary to the humor of man's corrupt nature, that it hath not one thought in the sinner's heart to befriend it. No wonder, indeed, the Mohammed's spice cup went down so easily, it being so lascivious and pleasing to man's carnal palate. That's M-A-H-O-M-E-T apostrophe S. We are soon gained to espouse that which gratifies the flesh and easily persuaded to deliver up ourselves into the hands of such opinions as offer quarters to our lust, yet yea, promise them satisfaction. Indeed, we cannot wonder to see Christianity itself generally and readily embraced when it is presented in Rome's hoarish dress, with its, in, its puri purity adulterated. But take the doctrines of the gospel in its own native excellency before it falls into those hucksters' hands, and it shall it is such a carnal heart cannot light, because it lays the acts to the root of every sin and binds defiancy to all that take part of it. This may make us step aside as Moses did once to behold the bush to see this great wonder. A doctrine believe and embrace that is pure nonsense to carnal reason, teaching us to be saved by another's righteousness, wise with another's wisdom, to trust him as a God that was himself a child, to rely on him to deliver us from the power of sin and Satan that fell himself under the wrath of men. Oh, how great a gulf of objections which reason brings against this doctrine must be shot before a man can come close with it. Yet this doctrine to find such welcome that never any prince at the beat of his drum had his subjects flock more in throngs to enlist themselves in his muster roll than the apostles had multitudes of believers offering themselves to come under baptism, the military oath given by them to their converts. 
Thirdly, consider how little worldly encouragement this word which they preached gave to his disciples, and you will say, God was in it of a truth. Had it been the way to thrive in the world, or had it won the favor of kings to have been their disciples and taught them how to climb the hill of honor, we could not have wondered to have seen so many worship the rising sun, but alas, the gospel comes not with these bribes in its hand, no golden apples thrown in the way to entice them. Christ bids his disciples stoop, not to take up crowns in their hands, but a cross for their backs. If anyone will be my disciple, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. They must not dream of getting the world's treasures which they have not, but prepare to part with what they have. When the apostles preached it, the way it led to was not to the prince's palace, with their preferments, but to prisons and dungeons, rackets and gambits. Now to see poor creatures so far forgot, forget all their worldly interests, estates, honored children of their loins, wives of their bosoms, so as to trample upon them, yea, joyfully welcome the bloodiest death their enemies could invent, and thank their persecutors for the favor admitting them to share with the torment of their brethren, as if they had gone to divide a spoil and not to be made one. This surely speaks a heavenly power to be in that doctrine on whose altar and for whose defense they were so willing to be sacrificed. But though the profession of the gospel cost them so dear, yet would it, ha it but have endowed his disciples to have aimed at their own honor and pleased themselves with the renown they should win by their sufferings and that their names should be written and read in the leaves of fame when they were dead and gone. Some Roman spirit might have found to be to have endured as much as if it had taught them that they should have ascended into their fierce chariots of martyrdom to receive heaven's glory as the purchase of their patience and proudness. This might have hardened some popish shoveling against the fear of those bloody deaths they met with, but the doctrine they preach allows neither, but teaches them when they have done their best and suffered the worst that their enemies' wrath can inflict for the cause of God, to renounce to the honor of all and write themselves unprofitable servants. All these considerations united make a strong cord to draw any that have staggered in this particular to a firm belief of the divine parentage of the scriptures. End of chapter 11, having been read by Peter John Parises.